What up gamers? I'm Jason. I'm Julie. And today on Dice and Dragons we are going to be reviewing Disney Sorcerer's Arena Epic Alliances, the core set published by the Op Games and designed by Sean Fletcher. Now I'm going to toss it over to Julie who's going to tell you more about the game itself. So this is a competitive skirmish game that is intended for two or four players, not two to four, two or four. Yeah. So heads up or team battle. Uh, for ages 13 and above, the box says 35 minutes or above. Our experience is about 45 to 60 minutes, right? Yeah, I would say that is definitely about right. So you could definitely get this down to that 35 minute mark easily, which is some more playtime and more experience with the game. So before Jason goes on with what the game is about, I'd just like to say thank you to the op for the review copy. Uh, we do appreciate it. Uh, but we'd like to remind our viewers that our opinion will remain our own. All right, and now let's talk about this game. So you are a summoner, and who are you summoning? Well, you are reaching out through the multiverse of Disney and Pixar movies. You're summoning different characters and recruiting them to your team to fight in this epic arena. Now this does have a King of the Hill style element with these three gold spaces, where if you control them at the start of the next turn, you will be gaining victory points. That's to push each side together in combat. You have a hand of cards that's based on the different characters. You will then be playing cards some may be movement cards in green some may be attack cards in red you can only play one card per action for each character and you're going to try to get the most victory points by the end of the game now end game is triggered when you either run out of your deck of cards or once a player gets to 20 victory points at the end of that round that is when the game is going to end now if i did make a mistake on that please correct me down below in the comment section the rule book goes through the rules in chapters so there was one or two things i didn't love about it but after chapter two it says 20 victory points it does not revise those rules in chapter three it just adds new stuff to it so just wanted to make that clear in case we misunderstood it. I also think the 20 victory points really well because it keeps that play time around that 35, 45 minute mark. Did I miss anything at all, Julie? I don't think so. All right, on that note, no, we are going to grab our drink and, you know, in the spirit of friendly competition, grab our fellow summoner. I'm going to take it to the table one more time. One more time. I wonder who's going to win. Well, hopefully it's not like the other games and it'll be you. Maybe I'll figure it out this time. I think you can. I think I can. I think I can. Now I'm going to take a quick look at the components for Disney Sorcerer's Arena Epic Alliances. So we'll start with the acrylic standees. We have the standees uh, with some nice bases. They look really good. We also have different ranks for the characters. There are a total of four bases, but I just have the three that Julie and I have been using out on the characters that we've been uh, playing with. We've got Dr. Fessivier here. We've got Demona. Looks awesome. We have Sorcerer's Apprentice Mickey. So makes more sense to have a uh, Sorcerer's Apprentice than just Mickey Mouse. We have Aladdin. Looks cool as well. Sully taking on the, the tanking roles. Gaston doing dastardly things and dealing a lot of damage, just like in the films. We've got Maleficent and Ariel, a fan favorite, of course, from The Little Mermaid. Next to them here, we've got the tracker for the status effects that you'll be stacking up on there just to tell you how many uh, how many iterations of them are on there well if you've been shrunken three times you got four or five magic brooms if you're doubly strong things like that we've got the victory point tokens and the nominations of five and one and the initiative tracker just to help you remember which player's turn it is so as you can see we've got the initiative tracker here oh, sorry the mode is upside down and they are all double-sided as you can see there's red and there's blue so double-sided i've got them on there and then this is their initiative value which is used to determine turn order which we're going to review once we uh teach you how to play the game. So we've got two stacks of status effects here, each different colors. Now there's not just one type, as you can see, there's taunt, tough, stealthy, strong, shrunken, you get an idea. Same thing goes for this orange stack. I haven't quite figured out what the difference is. I think it's just to showcase 
I guess the importance of the ability. I know Curse and Flustered are pretty bad in the Magic Broom, which is only for for Mickey is really strong and is, you're gonna always kind of kind of keep it in uh, in play. Could also be that they're only associated with one single specific character. You've got two different reference cards here, the chapter one and two reference, and then the chapter three, four reference, which you're gonna be using primarily as this contains all of the rules for the game. Next, each character has their sheet, which lists different elements here that can then be discarded from your play pile to upgrade them. So you need to upgrade two of these and two of these. Don't worry because you mix your hands together with all the characters you pick. That's that's possible. You got their skills, their movement, standard move action, their action, standard action value, their card value, their health, and their victory points. So you have that for each and every character. So for the, all eight of them. Oh wait, I've got two off to the side here. It's like, that doesn't feel like eight. Of course, no, we've got Sorcerer's Apprentice, Mickey, and Demona. And when you flip them over, you do get to see the upgraded side. Sometimes you'll be flipping them back. Other times you will not. They'll be upgraded like this for the rest of the game or until they are defeated. Well, looks like we were taking a look at the upgraded side of Mickey and Demona earlier. Now I've got everything back in matching order. Next, and we're not gonna go through all these with a lot of detail, but you'll be able to see them. We've got 10 cards for each of the different characters. And you can see the different elements on there. So that's what I was telling you here, what their 10 cards have for elements, and then what you can discard to upgrade them. So really just a quick look at the components, like I said. So there you have it. We've taken a look at the components. Now keep it right here, as I'll be teaching you how to set up and how to play the game. Now we're gonna teach you how to set up and how to play Disney Sorcerer's Arena. Now, part of the board has been cut off up here. That's okay, we're only gonna be using this uh, part of the board. Uh, set up in terms of the teams is very standard. I'm using the same setup that Julie and I used in our last play. Uh, her team, the red team, consists of Ariel, Dr. Fessilier, and Aladdin. What you can do is you can pick any places for them to start. These rear starting spaces are going to be used as respawn locations if you've been defeated. These front two spaces are only used at the very start of the game. And the team that I played, the blue team, consists of Maleficent, Gaston, and Sully. Now, the next thing that you need to do is decide your initiative order. To do that, what you do is you put your characters in the order you'd like them to act. In my case, I selected Sully, Gaston, Maleficent. For Julie, she selected Aladdin, Ariel, and then Dr. Fessilier. What we need to do is we compare our starting characters and whoever, whichever character has the lowest initiative number, so in this case it is Aladdin 16 to my 79, will be the first player to act. You then set up a nice initiative track here, which makes it very easy to keep track. That's what everyone is doing. You use the round marker, which you'll put into place over Aladdin's head. Now each player will draw a starting hand of cards from their deck. To do that, you're going to compare, well, you're gonna take a look at your card numbers, so two, two, and three. So red team starting hand will be seven cards. That's also gonna be the max hand size. We'll draw seven, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So there we go. We've got our starting hand of cards. And then with regards to blue team, you'll take a look, Sully is two. I just had the reference card in, in there. Melissa is two and Gaston is one, meaning you only get a starting hand of five cards. And you can see our five, well, sorry, there's an extra card here, but this is our five card starting hand. So a lot of Maleficent cards, not a lot of Sully cards, which is something that can happen. So keep that in mind as you're shuffling up your deck. So in this case, it is Aladdin's turn. Now, before we do, anything else in the game, we need to check the status effects and victory point spaces as is the starting round of the game. We can skip that. Would return any active KO'd character to the arena. So if someone was KO'd, they could return to any one of these spaces on their side of the board. And then we will go ahead and draw a card. So each player will draw a card, add it to their hand. So we add complete collection 
to red team sand, and then we add entrancing approach Maleficent's card to blue team's hand. Now I'm just gonna take a quick look here if we have any Sully cards. Yeah, we, we got some coming up here. We got at least one, so that works well. Next, we have our movement phase, action phase, and skill phase that we can do in any order. So it's entirely up to us what we'd like to do. Also, during the movement phase the act and the action phase, you may discard any card from your hand in order to move an extra space or gain an extra uh, damage. So keep that in mind. In this case, we're gonna start with Aladdin. So what he's able to do is one jump ahead, discard any card from your hand to give Aladdin stealthy one. Stealthy has the effect of uh, making it so that people have to banish cards in order to attack your character. We're not gonna go over all the status effects. You can find them here on the back of the rule book. That's one thing we can do. Then we've got Thieves Cure, reveal the top card of a rival summoner's deck. Check if the rival character matching the card is adjacent to Aladdin, you can recover one. Now if we do want to peek and see what's happening though, we can decide to reveal blue team's cards. We see that it's wide swipe, meaning that next turn, each person adjacent to Sully could take some damage. So we'll have to keep that in mind as he goes first. Well, he's a, he goes early. Now let's take a look at the cards and see what we're looking at doing. Now we might we want to try to move here. We've got Choose a Rival adjacent to Aladdin. No, both Thievery, Driving Waves. Nothing great. Move up to two spaces, binding to the Bazaar, and Aladdin gains two Stealthy. That seems to make the most sense right now. Or we can try to move one, two, three by discarding a card to get into the space. But right now, people are going to try to attack us. Having Stealthy is good. Two Stealthy means that's going to last a couple of rounds. So we're going to go ahead and play that for Aladdin for his movement phase. Now we can also play a card again, an Aladdin card on his uh, action phase. But for right now, we're going to do this. So this will get discarded. So he moves two spaces. We're gonna wanna make sure we can take that space. We're gonna take Stealthy, attach it to his character, add two tokens to it, which we're gonna tick down as we go through stuff. I know we got a little bit of glare from the camera, so I apologize on that, but uh, best I can do right now. Next, we can take a look and see if there's an action that we want to do for his action phase. I don't believe we've got any allied attack cards with range. We've got disarm. So only for an adjacent rival, we could deal two damage if someone was adjacent to us. That is not the case. So we're going to end up passing our turn. Now, one thing I just neglected to mention, but it's fairly obvious, when you start the game, make sure that all your characters are at max health. This now moves down and it is Sully's turn. And Sully can't beat up Aladdin. And just take a look at where I moved him. I'm gonna move him on the other side because I said I keep combat on this side. But you might want to try to get to that, that space, that King of the Hill space. We got some really cool cards with Maleficent. But at the same point in time, if we don't move, we don't get some people going, we just have all of our stuff. We're gonna to need to make some choices. So range two, choose one damage. So that's direct damage. So that's what this symbol means, direct damage. Uh, this damage symbol here, which is difficult to see, means indirect damage. Indirect damage can affect stealthy characters, so that's a way that we could hit Aladdin, so I'll have to keep that in mind. Gaston can move up to three spaces, meaning he's gonna go there, but let's discard a card. Forest of Thorns is kinda cool. Dragon form, let's be honest here, I normally would never discard it. It's a great card, range three, it does tons of healing. I am gonna discard it now, just because this is a tutorial, and it's a card that's the least useful for me in playing out two rounds of the game. So we're going to discard this to increase Sully's ability to move. So he's going to move one, two, three spaces. Get right in there. Now, I do have the choice. I could banish a card, which means remove it entirely from the game in order to go ahead and damage a ladder. Now, I don't think it's necessarily worth it, but just to give you an idea, I will go ahead and do that. I'm gonna banish this card so Overflowing Anger gets removed from the game. I also would have a choice of discarding a card to make it so I could do one extra damage. 
Now, if you take a look at what my standard attack is, standard attack is two, standard move is two. So these are the actions that you'll be taking if you're not playing a card. That's, and so far, that hasn't happened. I played a card every single time. But I, I like to do three damage to Aladdin. He's a little annoying here. But I like all the cards that we've got. So you know what? No, it's not gonna happen. We're just gonna hit Aladdin for two damage. Not gonna discard that card. Already banished the card. So we knock him down to seven. So next, it becomes Ariel's turn. And if you're taking a look at stuff, I haven't done Sully skill because it doesn't apply, but we're gonna use Ariel's skill right off the bat. So we can choose, reveal the top card of your deck. So that's what we'll go ahead and do. It is an Aladdin card. So it's not an arrow card, I can't draw it. I can discard it. And one card recovers one damage or put it back. At this point, because it's the carpet swoop, I'm just going to put it back. Now her movement is two and her standard attack is two. So we're definitely gonna move close to Sully. I'll go to that space even though it's not the one that I like the most. Take a look at what we've got here. We got range two, choose one, deal three damage to a rival. Discard another action card to deal three damage <clears throat> to the rival and the summoner loses a victory point, which we don't have yet, but this is a great attack. It does six damage. So that's to a guy like Sully. And we'll discard the other aerial card because I can potentially pull some more aerial cards. So as I get discarded, we've got range two. So Ariel could actually be a little bit further away if I wanted. Try not to get too close to become an easy target for someone else. So at that point we can hit Sully because he's range two for a total of six damage. So that's half of Sully's health right off the bat. Just a little over half, actually. So that's a great, great attack. Next, we move down to Gaston. And we saw the card that he's gonna use earlier. So you can move any status effect of any choice from Gaston, he can move up to three spaces. Now, one of the great things that we wanna do right now is we really wanna go and get the space for the victory point. So that's, that's Gaston's turn, even though we're not getting an attack. That'll be his movement phase. We can also take a look at the top card of our deck. If it's an attack, which was revealed to us early, which is good, this is Gaston's ability. Now it's not gonna last, but it's good to show it to you anyway. So we reveal it's an attack. Gaston gains strong one. So you definitely wanna do that effect before you attacked. Now you move down to Dr. Festivian, who's Ability is target reading, reveal the top card of your deck. That card is a magic card. You gain an additional action phase this turn, which could be movement or action. Otherwise, reveal a random card from your hand. So let's see, we have some magic. We actually saw it earlier. It's a magic carpet, so we're actually going to get an extra action phase this turn, which is pretty cool. So we're definitely gonna move one, two. And we're gonna move another one, two. We wanna attack, but well, maybe we didn't wanna actually move quite there. We can add a status counter. Got slimy little frog range two, one drive will gain strunction. Add one status counter to any number of status effects. Well, we, we wanna move closer. It's got range two. Yeah, so that actually, that's not a bad idea to move twice, but you know what, we're not gonna do that because we'll move so we're all in the back here, so we're just not in a good spot. But we're the Scudder cards move one, two, three. We're gonna use same little frog to shrink. So this is something you're not gonna see. This is shrunken. It's gonna go over here. So it'll be off camera, but shrunken will affect Gaston. And it's shrunken one. Normally you try to get a little bit more. But uh that's what we can do. And then our standard attack is a little bit weaker than the others. It's one, so we'll cast down for one damage. Now note, I'm not making the, the best plays here. I'm just showing you different things that you can do. And lastly, it is Maleficent's turn. And we're, we're gonna kinda go all out here. Got some cool stuff. So we can move up to three spaces with Entrenching approach, so we do that, we'll move 
One, two, three. Then we have this fantastic card. To the straight line of adjacent spaces from Maleficent to an edge of the arena, deal two damage to each rival in that line. And it's indirect damage, meaning Aladdin's Stealthy doesn't work. So we can just shoot right along this line and deal two damage to Aladdin. As well as Ariel. All right. And that is now the end of the phase. So what is gonna happen next? Well, we go to check status effects. So we're gonna remove a point from Stealthy, remove a point from Shrunken and the whole thing, remove all of Strong. Each player draws a card into their hand. So we get the carpet swoop. Next we draw Sully's Wide Swipe. As you can see, one team's running out of cards, so card management and the things you can do are very, very important. Now, it, once again, it goes to Aladdin's turn. At this point, pushing someone back or getting that space is gonna be important. Ah, I forgot to mention, we check for victory points. We get two victory points for blue team. I'll just put them over here. Say they got them because they've got these spaces. The other way to get victory points are the values based on the characters when you defeat them. Now, Sully is, is close to getting knocked out. It'd be great if Aladdin had a way to do it. Now, we've got Disarm, which is a great thing that Aladdin can do, actually. So he's not actually going to move here. Uh, he can move afterwards and watch you out, probably have him just move off camera to move towards another victory point space, because that's what would be smart. So we played this arm. We're good doing this first. Deal two damage to an adjacent rival. And then forces them to reveal their hand. And as we do the wide swipe, the arm lets Aladdin shuffle this back into our deck, meaning Sully does not have a chance to use wide swipe. He takes another two damage, knocking him down to just three health. Not a fun place for him to be. Aladdin can use a special ability with the Thief's Cure. So he gets to go ahead and reveal the top card of Blue Team's deck. It is a Sully card, meaning Sully's adjacent to him. He will gain a health. And then he can go ahead and move one, two, which will take him just Slightly off camera, that's okay. We're ending this after this round. Oh, I forgot to slide this down and back up. It is Sully's turn. Not a lot of great stuff for Sully to do, unfortunately. So at this point, we don't want to banish a card when we have one card left. We don't necessarily want to move, per se, but we're not in great shape. Ariel's probably going to take us out. So at this point, actually, better off moving, hitting Ariel for two, knocking her down to four. Hopefully someone will be able to finish her off. We slide down to Ariel's turn. And take a look at what we have. So we do have a few different things. Deal three damage to an adjacent rival. Reveal the top card of your deck. If it's an attack card, move the rival up to two spaces. So she just needs to hit him for three. And that, that's exactly it. So we can either discard a card or use this. I think driving waves is probably actually a better move. So we'll just go ahead and use driving waves. So he gets knocked out. So he's over there on the board, meaning seven. Victory points are now gained by the red team. And she can move forward one, two. It's Gaston's turn and he doesn't have a lot that he can do, but he's gonna take a look and see if there's attack card, which was revealed earlier, which is so he gets strong, which will increase his damage by one. So I'll do it right, we'll just take strong. Put it back out. I think I put it under the, sh the other one under the shrunken. It's all good. This increases my damage by one. So we'll just hit Dr. Fessy for three damage, knocking him down to four. It's so now the good doctor's turn. We do have add up to one status counter to have one status effect on any number of characters. If three or more characters have status effects on them, you get to draw two cards. That's not the case. At this point, we don't necessarily want to assist 
Uh, Aladdin, even though he's stealthy, we don't get a lot of great effects, but we will attack Gaston just with another one. And it's time for us to sort of pull back a little bit. But we do have a talking point so we can reveal the top card of our deck. So if we get an additional action, we do not. So at this point, we're going to move back one, two. Now, one thing I've just been doing, and you would not do this, the discard pile has been just sort of mixed together with everyone's cards. I'm going to separate them out just so we can talk about upgrades in just a moment. So it comes, let me now go down to Maleficent's turn. Um, I think we want to try to upgrade Maleficent. So to upgrade her character, what you're going to do is discard cards equal to these values. Well, you'll see the cards in the discard pile. And we're going to look only at theirs. Well, we unfortunately do not have the ice symbol. We've got the green symbol. We need two of these ice element cards. But we're just going to pretend, because I've mixed all these cards together, that we happen to have the ability to upgrade. So there was enough in there. Let's pretend that that was the ice. We could upgrade Maleficent, meaning we now get this upgraded side or skills and everything remains the same, except Whenever you play or discard a magic card during Maleficent's turn, you get to deal one damage to a rival. So that's really, really powerful and can be a game changer. And what she wants to then do is she can choose one to deal one damage to a rival. That rival gains two immobilized. So she can put someone in place, free someone in place, or deal one damage each to two rivals. Probably a good thing to do would be to stop Dr. Fessilia or Aladdin. So she'd have to move at least one, two, and then make sure that Dr. Fessilier was uh, immobilized, but only deals one damage to him. So it's not much, but does some stuff. He's immobilized. That doesn't really work the best because <laughs> the end of the round's coming, so the immobilized is actually just going to go away, but you gotta get where I'm going with this. Uh, a more useful thing for her would be to be further up the initiative track in order to be able to mobilize someone during the turn. So the way you set up this initiative track is very important. One of the reasons we've got Sully up here is he's got some tough cards, which really only come into play when he is in the lead. But we did a magic card, we used a magic card so we could also deal another damage to him from Maleficent's upgraded ability. But I covered enough about the game. It really wasn't supposed to be an in-depth long look at it. Really want to just cover the action phases, show you the skill phase, show what you need to do, discard down to maximum hand size. As you've seen, we've we've done it. And uh sorry, we haven't done it, but it's never really been a factor in the games we've played. And you're turning in, you restart, you're gonna make sure that you always use the chapter three and four reference sheet because this has got all of the rules, which is what we just went over. So there you have it. We've gone over how to play Disney Sorcerer's Arena. Now keep it right here as Julie and I will be coming back at you with a review of the game. So Julie, what did you think of Disney Sorcerer's Arena Epic Alliances, the core box for the game? Yes, there are some expansions coming. There's even one that's already out. Well, I think anybody who's watched the channel knows I, I like my Disney. Uh, so that's that's always a fun thing. Uh, and we've been watching a lot with The Little Man uh, recently. But not a lot of these ones actually you have to say i don't think we've watched aladdin beauty and the beast little mermaid sleeping beauty we definitely haven't watched monsters inc or the princess and the frog or pixar so i'm looking forward to seeing more pixar characters uh so <laughs> first and foremost th these are very very pretty acrylic uh standees Yes, they did a great job with the acrylic standees. I do like the production quality. The one complaint I have is with regards to this, the way the uh, this sits on there for tracking their health. I think I would have just preferred it if it clipped upside down. You can use it upside down uh, as well, but I don't think it's quite as clear with just how that uh, goes through. It definitely does seem like it was meant to be clipped 
gone over the top. So that was the only thing that I didn't really like about the acrylic standees. Oh, and if you've never set them up before, you do need to peel off the protective plastic, which is a little annoying. Helps when you've got a lovely wife who's got some nice nails to do it for you. Uh, so also, I mean, it's good quality uh, corrugate uh, for the components. I don't think we'd need to sleeve this. Um, you know, maybe I'd feel differently when little hands start playing with it. But yeah, it's it's borderline. I have to say the cardstock is fine, but it's as you can see, it's a little flexible. It's not the best, but it doesn't mark up from shuffling. No, so far. Yeah. Um, so about the game itself. So first of all, this is a skirmish game and I, I mean, un unless I've forgotten, I don't think I've played a skirmish game before. Uh, I don't know, at least not with us. We don't have uh, one that's hit the table yet. We will be reviewing God Tier within the next couple of weeks. We wanted to start out with this one. Also following the order that the review copies came in, this came first. So it just felt like a natural way for us to get started with this type of game and then go on to one that's a little more complicated. Um, so so I wasn't sure how I'd feel about it, and I can definitely say that um, I don't know if I lack the experience of something that would help me with this, but um, of the games that we played, I didn't win any. Uh, I didn't lose them catastrophically, um, but it often felt like you had a strategy that I wasn't seeing uh, in this. So I don't know if my brain just doesn't work um, for this kind of uh, strategy, which would lead me to say that uh, I think that for younger kids, I don't know what that camera, what the age is for this. Uh, neither can I write at the moment. It's not actually printed on the box, but I do believe that this is the kind of game that they would say probably for ages 7 and up, or maybe 10. Actually, you know what? It is printed on the box. I just can't quite see it. 13 and above. Yeah, that so, makes it makes sense because you need so a little bit... It's a bit, faded purple. <laughs> it's a, you need some strategy, um, and I'm sure that the new generation, the younger generation, uh, probably has a little bit more experience with uh, this kind of thing if they've played video games, because I presume there's a little bit of strategy like this in video games. Oh, no, most definitely, especially if they've played anything like League of Legends or things like that. No, you probably don't want your kids playing League of Legends online, but if they played any type of MOBA multi multiplayer online, online battle arena type game where you've got different characters that need to work together they'll be able to play this that's why i did say that some people could play this at a younger age of seven because there's definitely nothing really objectionable in the content the rule book's fairly straightforward in terms of what you need to do to play the game and the gameplay is not the the most difficult as as julie said it's making everything work together <clears throat> well in cnr last game that we just finished um I, at one point I said, yeah, this is not going to turn out well for me because Jason had 15 victory points and I had two. 16, actually. <laughs> okay. I was like one character away from winning the game and you had a character at one health. I was like, yeah, this is basically over. You almost wanted to call the game, but then what happened? <laughs> well, well, then some of my combos were able to, I was able to change a couple, chain a couple combos with a couple different uh, characters. Uh, and I came close. I mean, it ended up the game, uh, you win the game when a, a player hits 20 victory points. And, and you, you finish the round. So the player with the most victory points at the end of the round is the winner. Yeah, so Jason had 20 and I had 18. So it wasn't that far off. Uh, that being said, I wasn't anywhere near close getting to near getting, uh, I guess we could have gotten potentially two more victory points at the end of the round from, uh, from being on. Uh, no, that would be at the start of the round. So in any case, uh, it's, uh, how can I say this? It's, a, it's, it's an okay game. It definitely does, does what it sets out to do. Um, I can see playing this um, with other people. I'm not so sure I enjoy it as much at two players. You, we did say that it could be played at two or at four. Yeah, it's, can, you can play a 2v2 team battle version of the game, and I think that could be a lot of fun as well. I'm also wondering if this isn't appealing to you right now because of the choice of characters. You seem to like playing more of the Disney heroes, and one comment that we made off camera that I want to reiterate here, the villains seem really, really good. I mean, I was playing as Gaston, Maleficent, and uh, Sully. Sully makes a great tank in terms of just taking damage, being very hard to hit. Maleficent has some incredibly powerful cards. She could be at one health and you'll be sitting there like, ha ha ha, perfect. I'm going to win the dragon form full heal and knock you out, which no one else has a card like that in the game that we've seen so far. 
No, and again, uh, Dr. Fessili is the one that uh, kept me in the game. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, from that perspective, I think if you had a villain's team, you definitely could uh, could do a lot better than, you know, than what we did. And maybe it's the order the cards came out in as well, because... Oh, you really messed up my plan at the end of the game. I thought it was done, and she got another two, three rounds out of the game. Um, and, you know, and there's a couple of my cards uh, uh, that would have been more fun at more than one player. I mean, Aladdin has a card that he can jump through four, up four spaces, uh, and whichever uh, players he goes through, whoever their handler is, loses a card. So when you're playing two players, it's always only one card that you lose, but you can make more than one player lose a card if you're playing four people. So yeah. that could be uh, interesting as well. <coughs> Excuse me. No, there's there's a lot of strategy in this game. I mean, one of the characters that I didn't really enjoy playing uh, was Sorcerer's Apprentice Mickey because he's got an interesting type of strategy. It's something that I'm sure I'll figure out uh, the more that we play this game. But if you can build up his magical broom army, you can do a ton of damage with Mickey. It's just you have to really figure out some of the little nuances with the characters. They definitely all fit together a little differently, which you're talking about your own experience. Your team was a little bit on, on the weaker side, but you were able to pull off some really nice combos like after the fact. Ariel had a really nasty card where you got to deal six damage. I was quite surprised by that one, which actually I think was the thing that really kind of sort of swung it back into uh, being a very close game, as well as Dr. Fessilier doing a lot of uh, control elements with Shrunken and Flustered, really making things more difficult uh, on me. So. I have to say, I felt like your team started to come together a little bit later on. I thought that you were grasping a little bit more of the, the way that they work together. Now, I think anyone playing this game is going to have to get that level of experience with figuring out which characters work best together. And it's a game you're going to want to keep expanding. Yeah, but I also I want to add that it's also a question of the cards that come up. Um, because at the beginning of the game, I did really didn't have anything that would, that would help me out. Uh, and the bigger cards started coming out. Uh, towards the end of the game. I think if they had come out maybe a little bit sooner, I'm, it might have been a different uh, a different setup as well. So, or a different ending, I should say. Yeah. I also want to comment on the fact of these King of the Hill spaces, the spaces that give you victory points. I think that is a key element to this game because it keeps the players engaged in combat. It keeps the game progressing because if you don't engage people on those spaces, they're just going to keep getting more victory points and they may eventually win the game. So it will push combat and keeps the game at a relatively low play time, which is something that I really like about this. I say every game has been about, what, 45, 60 minutes and maybe even a little bit less than that? Yeah. No, I think everything they've done here in terms of creating a family style skirmish game. Oh, and one thing to recommend, sorry, not to recommend, to mention is when characters get knocked out, they come back into play. It means that even if you're losing, if things don't go your way, you don't feel like you're completely knocked out of the game. And from just our own experience, Drew was able to get back in it. Sure enough, you might be, you know, trying to figure out your way from behind the eight ball there, but it really feels like you're always involved and you're never going to necessarily feel bad by from having a character taken out, which for us is great because it's a competitive game where we're, you know, we're head to head, we're trying to beat up on each other, but nothing is really frustrating. Whereas if you take Sanctuary of the Keepers era, there are some really frustrating strategies where you just look at me you're like, I don't like you right now. That doesn't happen in this. There's always something you can do. Your characters will always be effective. And you know, maybe you don't want to attack and move every turn. You've got your strategies, you've got your things you're planning, but just remember, the other players can really mess with it as well. We ran out of magical juice there for just a second. Don't worry, we're recharged, we're back. And like I was saying, it was very lucky that I had Maleficent's skill that let me put a card back on top of my deck because Dr. Fessilia's flustered ability would have cost me one of my better cards. And I really do like the different skills and abilities uh, that each character has. They feel very asymmetric. That being said, I haven't quite figured out the nuances of using their upgraded uh, stuff yet. Some of the different upgraded abilities seem very strong, others not so much. Agreed, totally agree. So, um... I don't really have any much, no, anything else there. So, uh, rating time? Who yes, wants to go first? rating time. You take it away. Um, given that this game does exactly what it's supposed to do, uh, I think it does it well. I'm going to give it a six and a half. 
I just, it just doesn't make a seven for me just because I didn't uh, absolutely love playing it. Uh, and I can see playing it again, just not necessarily in a big hurry to play it again. Oh, I think this is one of the games that we'll probably play as we get some expansions for it. And I I see where you're going with the six and a half. I'm going to give this a, a definitely a higher rating. I'm going to give this a seven and a half because I think it executes everything incredibly well. But Julia likes to play heroes. And in this case, I don't find the heroes quite up to snuff as the villains. I do feel like that's going to change over time. But for right now, I do think that's a little bit of a disappointment. And I think it's one of the things that could have maybe got this an 8 for me and a 7 from Julie if we maybe had a few stronger heroes. I definitely think uh, Ariel is a lot stronger than I expected after seeing some of her later cards. But if we both played Aladdin, and I have to say I'm not the biggest fan of Aladdin. I do like Sully as the big tough character, but... I didn't feel like he was super powerful compared to when you look at Gaston and Maleficent. Gaston's shove, Maleficent's dragon form, and Dr. Fessilier's ability to control the board just seem a lot more interesting than what we have from the Heroes of the Box, and that just tweaks that a little bit for me. But if you get this game, if you get the expansions, I do think you're going to be quite happy with what you're getting. This game is very smooth and uh, in terms of design, easy to play, and I think it succeeds exactly what it wants to do. Just needs a little bit more content to really bring it up to that next level. So on that note, it's time to remind you to like, comment, subscribe, and hit the bell to be notified when we have new content for you. And take a look down below in the video description, you'll find links to all of our social media feeds, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. If you'd like to see some pictures of Julie and I playing Disney Sorcerer's Arena Epic Alliances, there'll be plenty on those feeds. Also down there's a link to multizone.ca, a great Canadian game store. Click that link, you'll get 10% off your next purchase. It's a great way to support the channel as a portion of that purchase will be returned to us. They'll definitely have some copies of the op games there, so make sure to check them out. And then popping up in front of me are gonna be links to some of our previously released videos. Over here will be our most recent release. And over here, it's gonna take you back to our review of Kingdom Hearts Talisman or Kingdom Hearts Perilous Pursuit. Uh, dealer's pick. All right, so one of those games I'll decide when I put this video together. With that being said, we now need to grab our drink, grab our best friend, We're going to keep playing games. Yeah, we're definitely going to keep playing this one. I'm really eager to see how Moana and Stitch play. So that's going to get you get this. I, I think Moana's probably going to have a lot of movement. What do you think? I think so, too. I mean, she is the uh, she's a Voyager. I was trying to think like Wayfinder. Like, no, it was Voyager. Sorry. Lots of different names out there for people that travel and show people the way.